All right, so I am blind. I can't see you, so you will have to yell at me or talk in Discord. Um, and please do yell at me. You should be able to see my slides now. So first, as a quick update, um, there's exercise two on the website. I pushed that due date back since I was slow at getting it released. However, there will be some reading for next week that I haven't uh, posted on the website yet because I've been running around like my hair is on fire. Uh, so later today, I will will get that information up. It won't be, um, ex it shouldn't be too much reading, but there will be a little for next Tuesday. So to start off, I wanted to quickly go back to Brad's talk. So he talked about Tamer. Then he talked about Tamer on a robot. And then he talked about empathetic. And the thing I wanted to emphasize is that these were really all approaches to using supervised learning for a sequential decision task. So instead of the RL framework, which we'll talk more about today, Brad's approach was to say, I just want to maximize this human reward or this human feedback. And in, in, uh, by just using um, regression to figure out what action will get me the most human feedback, he didn't need to go into the whole RL framework. So I was pretty excited about his talks. Hopefully you guys enjoyed them. Also, you may have seen on Discord that he did answer our questions. So I wanted to hop into some of those. And I was wondering if the, if the person who uh, had this question, thinking about generative or deep freak training, if they could maybe um, uh, uh, unmute themselves and talk about what, what they were getting at with this question, because I'm not sure I, I completely understood it. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was mostly thinking that uh, at some point he mentioned that getting people to do um, the training for it was actually kind of expensive and they were looking for ways to uh, broaden the data set. And then I kind of just thought that deep fakes would be a natural way to extend the data set. I see. Okay. Yeah. So when, when we're in Tamer, you have a person that is giving positive and negative feedback. If you wanted to, you could have an agent that gives positive and negative feedback to fake the human. You can do it if you do that, you can collect a ton of data very quickly. You can show statistical significance. And then once you're sure your method works, then you can go back to real, to real people. In this case, now I understand um, your, your point that if your data, if you're uh, not data rich, if your data sparse, how can you get enough training data? So maybe deep fakes could work. And then um, I did like though also Brad's point that you might be able to think about uh, uh, is the person faking or not. So there's there's been people talking about machine learning approaches. Basically, can you use machine learning for lie detector tests? Can you look at their EEG or other brain activity? Can you look at their emotions to try to understand if they're lying or not, or maybe what their real emotion is? And I go back and forth and whether that's uh, really cool or completely terrifying. I think, I think uh, it really depends on how it's used and who's doing the using. So there were a couple of people who talked about biometric data. So thinking about heart rate, or you could see if the person's face was flushed Maybe it could be voice. Someone was mentioning that, uh, you know, if something bad happens, the person might swear. So listening to that audio, I think all of those types of extra inputs could absolutely be really useful. And particularly when we had um, Kyle talk earlier this semester about gaze tracking. So figuring out how these different inputs could be used to the system. But I was particularly excited about gaze tracking because Brad was talking about what if there are two tasks? So what if you are, um, what if you're driving and you are, um, your, your um, emotions your, uh, are, are instead reacting to the car in front of you instead of what your car is doing? 
Or what if your reaction is in, uh, in terms of the, the song on the radio instead of the cars driving? So if, if you've got these kind of multiple tasks or if you've got distractor tasks, it seems like gaze could be useful to figure out what the person is actually focused on. Because if they're focused on the speedometer and seeing that you just accelerated a lot, that could be more useful than if they, you just accelerated a lot, but they're focused on the radio, or you te they can see that they're focused on the red Tesla in front of you. So I thought, I thought that was a potential interesting uh, point of future, future research. Okay, and then there were a bunch of questions about experimental design. So one of, one of them, I think a, a few people kind of asked around this, where trying to understand whether subjects know their feedback's being recorded or being used. So Brad was saying, well, we tell them, we, tell, we do tell them the truth. We tell them that you're being recorded, but we don't explicitly tell them that their implicit facial ex expressions are what they're measuring. So I thought that was kind of an interesting human subjects question. So how, how do you try to keep things authentic? And if they realize that they are, um, they are controlling the car based on their expression, they could very easily start acting in a, in a weird way. And one of the goals that, that Brad here was um, talking about, they, that the subjects could try to um, hide their, their, uh, their expressions if they knew what was going on, but also thinking about how bored they are because, and this is something we'll actually talk about later. Let's say you're a human that's teaching a robot to do something. Over time, you're probably going to give less feedback. That could, hopefully that's in part because the robot's doing better and you don't need to correct it so often, but it also just could be because you're having trouble focusing. So one, one approach would be to have uh, just short feedback sessions, or you might have to try to model how the human's feedback is fading over time. I know at least one instance of where people tried to inject errors into the agent so that the person would have to start paying attention again and say, no, that was wrong. The, uh, another person asked about, what about human to human? And Brad, Brad's response was, well, sure, a, a person may interact differently with an agent than with a human, but as long as you're collecting the test, the, the training data in the same place that you're testing, then it should be okay. So if you wanted to uh, train on a human talking with another human so that you could test in a situation where you're trying to evaluate a human as they're interacting with another human, that would be cool. That would be fine. But it's not clear, as this, as this question was pointing out, it may not be easy to generalize from human AI interactions to human-human interactions. I think that could be pretty interesting, especially when you're thinking about how people may or may not interact with AIs differently than other people. So you, uh, you may have heard this story before. Uh, a number of years ago, um, soldiers in, in the Persian Gulf were using these uh, bomb, bomb disabling robots and one of the robots blew up and the soldiers didn't want a new robot, they wanted their robot repaired because they, they, were, they developed a personal relationship with this inanimate object. And I could imagine that the way you interact with a robot could absolutely change over time depending on how you feel about it. And the same could happen with just uh, non-embodied AIs as well. Um, great, another, another mention about the uh, simplifying or exaggeration. Sorry for the walls of text. I couldn't really come up with good pictures. And then there was another point where, oh, this was the one where they're talking about how long do you make each trial? And Brad was talking about that people probably do change the reactions over time. So if they, they limited them to about three minutes, 
they were trying to make these, these interactions uh, as long as possible because you want to get more data, but short enough that you don't become bored. The other thing he was thinking about mentioning is that they, the, in the current paper, they predict reward. But remember, he said there's lots of different things you could try to predict. So if you were um, looking at the, the um, human's belief over possible agent policies, or thinking about the human's um, understanding of the agent's return, then these are much longer term predictions. So if, if you're trying to understand, is the, human's, um, is the human's face related to what I just did, this one action, or is the human's face related to whether they think I'm going to make or lose money? And make or lose money could be this long-term prediction. In, at the end of three minutes, do I think I'm gonna have a positive or negative balance? So that could be, could, could be quite different. And then there was the, again, the, the question about monetary compensation came up. So let's say at, at the end, you get a, a participant gets a reward of plus 10. And you could say, well, participants with the plus 10 get uh, $1, or maybe they get $10, or maybe they get $100. And you might think that having higher compensation amounts could get stronger reactions. I think that that would be pretty cool to test. It, I would guess that would be true, but maybe not. Um, I wonder, if, in addition to changing the compensation, can you think of any other ways that you might get people to display more emotions? You can make it more of like a, an emotionally charged um, uh, video or whatever you're watching. Like you could make it, I don't know, violent or something like that. Yeah. So instead of uh, hitting people, you could hit hit uh, small kittens. Yeah. So we definitely we could make we could make things more distressing. I wonder if there'd be a way to make things better make people happier somehow. I'm not sure. Maybe if you give like output of the system, what it thinks the people's emotions are, then they can like Ooh. calibrate their emotions. Like if they see that the robot thinks that everything's ambiguous, they might emphasize a little bit more. Yeah, nice. Yeah, so if, if the people know that they that the robot is paying attention to their face and it's more of a figuring out how to con uh, how the person should influence the system uh, deliberately rather than in implicitly, that could work well. I think you definitely also need a, some kind of a, a setup that seems reasonable um, or, or like there's no, there's no point in it that you can kind of poke fun at. So for instance, the, the car taxi one that we we're looking at, I immediately found it funny that you break even if you run over a person and hit a car and hit the whatever the construction thing that was considered like a zero sum game you've crashed twice you've picked up one person but dead even so, so something like that i feel like is going to have me doing the wrong emotion sometimes yeah that's a great point so if instead of a silly video game what if it was something that actually mattered and the rewards that were coming in had some understandable real value. So for instance, if you were trying to get a system to learn how to uh, help someone and the system's failure actually hurt that other person, the, so the person wasn't able to use the robot to pick something up off the floor for them, then maybe that because it's more real, they might get more authentic or larger um, emotional swings. There's also a, a suggestion in Discord where people might be more expressive if other humans are present. So thinking about how you could change the setting. So I, I remember that uh, a study showing that if you had, you put up a pair of eyes 
over the coffee machine. So if you ask people to put in 25 cents for a cup of coffee, if you have a pair of eyes on the wall, people are more likely to drop that quarter in the pot because they feel like they're being watched. So maybe there are some other environmental changes that Brad could do in order to get more expressiveness. Cool idea. Okay, and then there were a few questions about actual applications. So Brad, Brad was saying that, yes, if I'm in a, in a car, I might be reacting to what other people are doing more than what my car is doing. So trying to, to figure out what to pay attention to, that's pretty important. And then there's another person um, we're thinking about uh, assigning reactions to the behaviors rather than the external factors. So would I didn't I didn't quite understand this question. Maybe the 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 person who had asked this would be willing to unmute and talk about what they were thinking. Yeah, that was uh, my question. I was just wondering about like in the self driving car example, how you know somebody's frowning at the vehicle's behavior rather than like a conversation going on in the car or like a thought they've just had that was unpleasant. Oh, 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 now I get it. Okay. Okay, so that's that's pretty pretty similar to the other question. I was just misinterpreting it. Yeah, so figuring out how to how to assign uh, blame or or reward is it is it something else or is it actually the car is super important. And then someone was talking about uh, thinking about aware and unaware trainers. So again, going back to the idea of, are we just looking for um, inherent reactions or do we want to also have people that know their face is changing the way the car acts? And it seems like if you're in a self-driving car and its behavior is chased, changing based on your facial expression, it seems like that's something you need, would need to tell the customer. Um, and it, it seems like you would have to account for that. But I think the, the important thing is being able to have training data for that setting because we don't know whether it's going to generalize well from implicit expressions to knowing that the, the camera is watching you. Brad was also talking about using a different setting. So in RoboTaxi, who's looking at the immediate reward, are you hitting a person right now or not? And you could think of um, looking more about the, um, uh, ha sorry, having a, a winning or losing state. So thinking about there's this long, longer term task and I'm either gonna get that plus one or minus one. So I need to be thinking ahead to what's going to happen and not just the, the immediate thing that's happening right now. They're also thinking about temporally extended actions. So in an RL setting, this would be thinking about options. If my action is taking lots of time steps, how does that change? So I thought that was pretty cool too. All right, any, any final comments on, on Brad's uh, presentation before we head to the next topic? All right. So Brad, Brad talked about this a little, but I really wanted to emphasize the, the reason I think this, this stuff is cool is because we want people to be able to teach agents to do stuff. My parents aren't able to define a Markov decision process. My parents can't program, but they have, they have been able to teach a dog. So if, if people can teach dogs, why not teach robots? And we should be able to do this in a non-technical way that lets the robots or agents learn quickly enough to be useful and achieve pretty good performance. So that's kind of the motivation behind a lot of these methods that use this type of human feedback. So one thing I'd like to do now is to throw you, uh, throw you all into Zoom rooms and think about how else a person might be able to help 
an agent learn to do something or teach an agent to do something. So we talked about explicit feedback where a person would say good robot, bad robot or nothing. And also we talked about implicit feedback, looking at someone's face. How else might you be able to teach a robot to do something? So this is gonna be pretty quick. Uh, I'm just gonna give you like three minutes to just start uh, spewing ideas into the, into the Discord chat. All right, welcome back. So I, I see a few things in Discord. What, what did people come up with that was uh, non-standard? Would you be willing to unmute and just yell out? Seemed like uh, David, David had a good uh, non-standard comment. Throwing the agent off a cliff? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> the, the example I wanted to give was like a, babe, a mama bird. How does the mama bird teach a baby bird how to, how to fly? And how it does it is throwing it off of a cliff and like, you know, it has to kind of adapt um, to its situation. Has to kind of, uh, so I guess this is an analogous to um, let humans letting an agent explore somehow or directed exploration or something like that. Nice. Yes, that is some tough parenting. <laughs> tough parenting, I guess that's, that's the strategy. That's the next paper name, by the way. <laughs> um, let's see, so learning complex gold with it iterated amplification. What is that? I haven't read that paper. Uh, I haven't I haven't gone through the whole thing myself, um, but it's kind of similar principle behind um, self play. So you train one agent on a simple task, and then that agent basically helps the human in. Uh, so so the human the human is interacting with an agent on a very simple task. That agent becomes slight, like learns this task, and then can is can then assist the human uh, in teaching a more general agent, a more complex goal. So it's kind of the idea of having the, a, an agent sort of teaching a human how to teach a more complex or a more general agent. Nice. Okay, so that kind of more iterative uh, human AI interaction. Then there was the, in the Discord, there was um, looking at demonstrations, there was, uh, the human could just give the initial policy, could give rules of thumb, so advice like, don't, don't go near the cliff, it's bad for you. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, um, someone was talking about creating motivation. So, right, so thinking one thing you could do is an agent could have some inherent motivation to do different things and maybe the the person can, could nudge them in that direction so for instance if you want an agent to understand how a light switch works maybe you want the human to tell the agent you should figure out how the light switch works or you should be excited when the light turns on and off that's something that's interesting Don't go near the cliff. I'll throw you off myself. Nice. So um, another one thing we had thought of in the past uh, was trying to identify mistakes. So for instance, if the person is watching Pac-Man, the person could, uh, when Pac-Man makes a mistake, they could hit the space bar. Or maybe when Pac-Man makes a mistake, they could add a correction. You just went left, but you should have gone right. But I think I think there's a ton of types of um, interactions that humans and agents could have in order to uh, help teach or help bias. And I think I think that's I mean that's going to be true of supervised learning as well. But somehow for me, the human and agent interaction seems uh, qualitatively different than the kinds of interactions where a person is teaching a supervised learning agent. And I'm not sure whether that's because I'm biased towards RL or if there's actually a difference because in sequential decision tasks, you typically have an agent, a thing that's acting in the environment. Whereas if you, if you are trying to uh, help a scheduling system learn, it seems much less personal somehow. But I could just be making that up or others may, may completely disagree.
Okay, so I asked you for um, Tuesday's class, if you hadn't uh, done a lot with RL to, to watch that brief video on reinforcement learning, but I thought I would just give, give a quick um, kind of one slide reminder of the kinds of things we need to think about. So there are states, the agent is in some place, the agent's going to take an action, and then the environment figures out you were in a state, you took an action, what's the next state? Could be deterministic, it could be stochastic. You're gonna get rewards over time that you're gonna to try to maximize. Maybe there's a discount factor, so that means uh, a, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Getting a reward now is better than getting that same reward later. Your goal is to try to learn some kind of policy which is abbreviated PI, a mapping from states to actions. In this state, what should I do? And one way of learning, of learning that policy is to learn an action value function. So Q is taking a state action pair and trying to estimate what is the discounted sum of rewards that I will get. Basically, in my state, I could look at all the different actions and figure out what, which one will give me the most reward in expectation. So this is the basic RL setup. And once we have a human in the loop, you get a lot of other things. Well, and it, it doesn't even have to be a human, right? It could just be some kind of external thing. It could be another agent, it could be a database of information. So things, things like knowing, knowing that water is wet and that being wet is bad for electronics, maybe that's something that could help the agent um, some way. I think we already mentioned reward shaping. So instead of just the environmental reward, we could have an extra reward that the human is giving. Or in the case of Tamer, maybe we don't have an environmental reward at all, and we only have the reward coming from the person. You could also think about state augmentation. So the environment is telling something to the agent. Maybe the, the human is also giving the agent some kind of extra information. Um, a trivial example, if, if the uh, human was shining a laser pointer where you wanted the robot to go, you could say, well, that's just part of the environment. The human and the laser pointer are part of the environment and the agent, the robot, should be able to learn that the laser pointer is important. Or you could take the, take the approach that, well, I know there's going to be a human and the human has a laser pointer, so why not tell the robot you should pay attention to the laser pointer, it's a useful piece of information. Or you could even go all the way to saying you should pay attention to the laser pointer, you should go in the direction that the laser pointer is you could provide the agent with that extra bit of knowledge, that extra bias, so that it could learn that much faster. And you could also go all the way up to action forcing. So the agent says, I want to go left, and the human says, no, you're going to the right, by golly. And that, that could be good, because you keep the robot out of trouble, or it could be bad, because now you're limiting its exploration, and it's no longer learning on policy. The agent isn't doing what it wants to. It's kind of getting thrown around by the human. So that could be a good or bad thing. But these are all valid ways of the human providing extra or different information to the agent in a sequential decision task. So I wanted, I wanted to go back to the 2006 paper uh, by Thomas and Brazil. I, th I think this was uh, the first or one of the first or one of the better known papers where we're trying to, we're doing human subject studies and trying to get humans to teach a robot to do something, sorry, an agent. So you could do the simplest possible thing. So here is, here's a, a variant on Q learning. So in uh, Q learning, you could take an action based on your Q values. So if your Q values are all very similar, you could take a random action. If one action seems to be better than all the rest, you're more likely to take that action. And then the agent executes that action, and then it gets a reward. So if, it came, if the reward came from the environment, this would be normal Q learning. 
or it could come directly from a human trainer. And you could say, by golly, I'm just gonna maximize this, this reward. And what they found is that people seem to, um, well, there are a couple of things. So first, you were saying that the, the instructions clearly stated, I, I love that phrase, clearly stated, because that means the, the instructions were right and the people, those silly people just misinterpreted them. Um, so the instructions said that you should um, have general and object specific rewards. And on, on the next slide, I, I show the domain they're actually in. But people seem to assume object specific rewards were future directed. So they're thinking about anticipatory rewards or the agent is going to do something well in the future. And it's hard to disentangle the agent is going to do something well in the future versus the agent just did something before. Because depending on what the human is anticipating, things could go, it could, could be very different from reality. So they were in this domain called Sophie's Kitchen, where I believe they were trying to teach the agent to follow some recipe. And the tweak that they did to make this work is they had a guidance message. So the human could see here, the human could say, I'm focused on this bowl. So if the human says, I'm focused on the bowl, then you're going to take some action um, that, that has to do with that object. Otherwise, you just do your normal action selection. And by doing that, the humans were much better able to direct the, direct the robot, the, excuse me, the agent to learn the right thing. So providing not just the feedback, a good, good agent, bad agent, but also focus on this object. So that was one way of significantly improving, improving learning, giving this extra piece of information. And now that I say that out loud, it seems like you might be able to use gaze tracking again in this case. So that would be kind of cool. Oh, and uh, again, it, please do unmute and, and jump in at any time or, or drop questions into, into Discord. Um, it's very weird not being able to see people. Uh, but I wanted to enable this mode because I have a video to share later. Hi, Matt. Yeah, um, please. Sorry. So when they select G, does that like uh, give a subset of actions or is it included as like state information to the agent? Um, exactly. It's a I subset can... of actions. So now subset that, of actions. I see. Yeah. So now oh, the sorry. agent is going to be constrained to do something with that bowl. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, but you're right. You could also think of... Uh, I have, um, in my state, I have a bit vector, and it's a one-hot encoding, which flips to one the agent that the human is, um, the, the object that the human is considering. And this kind of goes back to the laser pointer example. I could either think of the laser pointer as just a normal part of my state, or it could be this explicit signal. And in this case, their explicit signal was saying, you have to act on this object. But, so they have, you have to act on this object, but they're still saying, I am getting a reward from the human and I'm going to try to maximize my expected long-term sum of rewards. So these rewards are assumed to uh, be short-term, correspond to specific actions. And then I want to do a bunch of those over time, try to maximize those, those rewards, robot cookies. Now this was in contrast to Tamer. So I think um, Brad talked about this a little, but didn't emphasize it as much as I think he could have. I think one of the really cool things from Tamer was saying that the reward model is thinking the human is giving you a return. So in, in RL terms, the return is the discounted sum of rewards. So what, what are all the rewards I'm going to get from here until the end? And you could think of saying the, the human is not giving you that immediate one-step reward, but is giving you the return. 
and I'm going to try to figure out how to maximize that return. So it's just a supervised uh, problem. And in Brad's case, I believe most of the time he would use plus one or minus one. You could, and then zero if the human was not saying anything. So that was the tamer case. In contrast to that is Sable. The idea behind Sable is you have this feedback from people. Why are you treating it as numeric? So if, you, if I say sit and the dog tries to shake, I say bad dog. If I say sit, the dog sits, I say good boy. Why is bad dog minus one? Why isn't it minus five? And if I don't say anything, why is that necessarily zero? Um, because one of the one of the problems uh, when you think about one of the, with Tamer, you're you're giving this uh, return, you're giving this human input, and the agent learns. Okay, this is this is what I need to do in order to get this get this human feedback. And then what happens when the human gets lazy, right? So extreme example, the human stands up and walks away. Now the agent's like, oh no, what I thought was right can't be right because now I'm not getting the human reward I wanted, I was expecting, I better do something else. So that could be pro pro problematic. So Sable says, instead of, instead of thinking of the human feedback as numbers, let's think of them as categories. So, uh, sorry, a little bit of um, uh, equation, a little bit of uh, math. So well, I shouldn't say math, um, just a, a few Greek figures. We've got some desired behavior, some desired policy, and we've got some history. So the person said sit, the dog sat, and then the person said good boy. And then we want to figure out based on the history, what is the map hypothesis of the desired policy? So I often get these confused. So I thought I would remind you map means maximum a posteriori probability estimate. So this is typically in the Bayesian setting and it's a way of just doing a point estimate. It says, I'm going to look at my prior, look at my evidence and figure out what's most likely. This is in contrast to the maximum likelihood estimate, the MLE. So the maximum likely estimate assumes uniform prior. So for instance, if I, if I give you a data set and I say, please fit a Gaussian or fit a normal curve to this, you would say, okay, that's easy. I can find the mean and standard deviation. And that's assuming uniform, uniform um, prior. Whereas if I say, here's a data set, find the um, mean and standard deviation, but uh, you should, uh, the prior, you've got high confidence that the mean should be around zero. That can give you a different estimate. So in this case, we're saying, I've got some prior distribution over policies. Maybe it's a well-informed distribution, maybe it's just a, a uniform distribution, but I've got this prior, and then I say, well, what's given uh, that a particular policy was what the human wanted, how likely is it that I would generate the history I saw? So then I can go through, let me think about all the different policies the human could have. Well, I'm going to identify the policy that based on the prior over policies and the one that is most likely to produce the history I actually saw. And then that lets us figure out what's the most likely. So this is not saying that the feedback is numeric. This is not thinking about plus five and minus pi. Instead, it's just saying I've got some observations, some actions and feedback, how can I maximize that likelihood? So I'm gonna pause here because this is, this is a, a great place to ask questions. Okay. Doesn't this yeah. still kind of boil down to a numerical representation? You've just kind of pushed it into being maybe more probabilistic than like distinctively like one, zero, or negative one. But, but, but there's Greek letters, there's no numbers here. So the, yeah, no, no I, that's a good point. <laughs> I just, 
You're right. There are Greek letters. I forgot. Yeah. So, but no, you're right. That this is this is absolutely probabilistic reasoning, which does depend on numbers. Um, but the difference is, I could have in, in this case, I could have lots of different kinds of. Is that true? Yeah. I could have different kinds of human uh, feedback. So, for instance. Um, thinking about uh, good, bad, and very bad. And I wouldn't necessarily need to assign a number to very bad. I could just think of it as a different category. Does that make a little, does that make sense? I, so I guess, yeah, I guess what, if, I'm, if I'm following, it's kind of, it takes away having to like arbitrarily define how good or bad things are and adapt it to the data you have, I guess is exactly. maybe the, the distinction. Cool, yeah, thank you. That's a good way of saying it. Um, is there any way you can go over that past example you said using this like kind of notation and formula where like a human maybe trained um, or helped the agent out and then he got up and left? Um, like, how would this be applied to that? Yeah, so in, in this case, we can think of, um, we've got this uh, past history. So we've got the, um, maybe the person says something, uh, there's an action, oops. And then there's feedback. And that was cool. Uh, and the difference here is Tamer is saying the feedback is zero. Here, we're saying if the person doesn't say something, that's just not informative. So if, if there is no good, good dog and there's no bad dog, we don't uh, assume that's zero. That's just another category. So I'll, I'll get, actually, let me, let me get into a concrete example in just a couple of slides. Okay, so we're, we're going to do some Bayesian reasoning, and we're going to just try to figure out what's the map hypothesis. Now, to make things a little more interesting, we've got some assumed behavior. So first, there's some probability that the trainer makes an error. So the, uh, the person hits the wrong button on the keyboard. That's, that's an easy way to think of it. And then there's also, let's assume I, I do make the right evaluation. The dog sits, I know, I, I said sit, the dog sits, and I know that was good. So I think the dog did the right thing. So I will say, good boy, with some probability, and I will not say anything with some bad probability. Or excuse me, with some with some of the rest of the probability. So let's the dog does the right thing. With some chance, I say bad dog, which is incorrect. With some probability, I say good boy, that was correct. And there's some probability that I don't say anything. So this is um, you could think about this. So for um, neutral feedback, not giving feedback, could be implicit communication. So if you are teaching a dog, in general, you don't hit the dog with a newspaper. Uh, punishing the dog in that way is not good for the dog. It doesn't help um, as much with training. Instead, you give positive feedback when the dog does the right thing and don't say anything if the dog does the wrong thing. So it keeps jumping around and trying different things until it gets that positive feedback. So different people in different situations could mean different things by neutral, by not giving any feedback. Um, okay, so if we've got this probability of messing up, we've got this probability of giving feedback when the agent is correct, and giving feedback when the agent is incorrect, now we can write down this whole messy formula. And assuming we know these probabilities, how often the human hits the wrong button, how often they reward or don't reward, then we can go and figure out exactly what is the map, uh, the maximum likelihood trainer policy. So this is strategy aware. So we think of uh, these variables as a training strategy, strategy aware Bayesian learning, Sable. So we could um, know those parameters because we've worked with this trainer for a long time, 
or we could try to learn these parameters. And that's inferring Sable or iSable. So if the behavior of the, the dog is consistent, reward is evidence for the task, punishment is give evidence against the task, and it turns out you could simultaneously learn what is the task the person is teaching, and you can learn the person's feedback style. It, it kind of seems like magic, but it turns it, it just kind of drops out of the Bayesian framework because you've got this history and you can just look at that history and your prior over policies and actually learn all of this. So it's, it's cool, but it can be very compute heavy. So what does this look like in practice? Well, um, uh, Robert Lofton and, and others trained a simulated dog to protect a field. So here you can see the dog moves in one of four directions. When the dog moves towards the rat, it chases the rat away. And in this case, the person says, good job, you get a green flash. When the dog does the wrong thing, it goes away from the rat, then in this case, the person is saying nothing. So over around 200 people did this, and we analyzed their behavior. So the, va the vast majority, well, I shouldn't say the vast, the majority said good job when the dog did the right thing and said nothing when the dog did the wrong thing. So that's the behavior we're seeing here. So then the agent can learn that saying nothing means I'm doing something wrong. There is also the group that said good when the dog did the right thing and said bad when the dog did the wrong thing. So in this case, um, let's see. So in the R plus P plus case, so when there is this explicit feedback, then if the person walks away, the agent uh, basically freezes its learning because the uh, saying nothing doesn't really have any useful information. In the other case, in the R plus P minus, now when the person walks away, the agent's going to think, oh man, my, my trainer's no longer saying anything. I must be doing something wrong. I better unlearn. So it really depends on uh, whether you are explicitly punishing and rewarding or not, whether you can, uh, whether there's a risk of unlearning as you give less and less feedback. I'll also point out there are some uh, mean people. These are the people who uh, grade undergrad exams. So when the, per when the agent does something wrong, they punish it. And when the agent does something right, they say nothing. And then there's just some people who are apathetic and just don't say anything very often. But it was interesting. I thought it was interesting that the, the vast majority did this rewarding and the majority of them did the same kind of teaching as, as you would do with the dog. And this was probably biased because we were recruiting uh, from dog training enthusiasts and we had that picture of a dog. So uh, the results show it works, hooray. Um, so in this case, what we did is we compared to, let's see, M plus, was equivalent to tamer. So we said uh, we would give the agent a plus one when the person said good, a minus one when the person said bad, and a zero when they said nothing. And the M zero was give a plus when they say good, give a bad when they say, uh, give a minus one when they say bad, and don't give anything when the person says nothing. The reason I wanted to show these graphs was this is a different way of kind of analyzing um, the performance of agents. So in this case, the y-axis is the number of actions or the amount equivalent to the amount of time that it takes to reach a criteria. Okay, what's a criterion? Well, for instance, you could say, how long does it take until the agent learns the perfect policy? And in this case, you can see the stable bar is lower, so you are able to learn faster. And you could think of, well, how long does it take to learn till I'm half right or 75% right? Or how long does it take until the person says, yeah, I'm satisfied, I'm gonna end this experiment. 
And then you could also, we also did um, used iSable and showed that that also can, can learn even faster, but it takes a lot, a lot of extra computation. So the, the take home point is you could treat Tamer, uh, treat feedback like Tamer does with a plus or minus one, or you could tr treat f feedback as categorical. And there's some evidence that that might work better. So Vlad, did that address your, your question or did I just mangle it? No, I think that's good. Yeah, it clarified a lot. <laughs> There's a lot more slides coming that I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, so it, um, uh, this probably is not too surprising, but I tend to expand more upon methods that I was involved in, in part because I've already got the slides built. Uh, it's, it's a whole lot easier to copy from existing talks than uh, making stuff up. Matt, I'm not sure I understand what the difference is between 100% and terminated in this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, what, and, and that's, that's a good point. So in this study, we asked people to train the dog to scare rats away from the field. And then you can leave, you can leave when, the, when the agent's trained. So we can, we can look, we can cheat and look inside the agent's head and look at its learned Q values or it's learned policy rather, and we can measure when the policy is perfect. And then at some point, the human's gonna say, okay, I've, I've observed this agent for long enough. I'm convinced that I can walk away. So I'm gonna stop now. And I think we gave them, a, we gave the participants on, on uh, Mechanical Turk a bonus if indeed the policy was perfect. So there was some incentive to stick around and make, make sure that the agent was doing well. So the reason to show that is if there was something weird where Sable reached 100% faster, but the people were not able to recognize it was trained, then, these, then we would see these lines being equal. But instead, there wasn't a very interesting thing. We just see that, yeah, a little bit after the agent gets perfect, people uniformly say, good job, agent, I'm going to go do something else. Makes sense. Hi, Matt. Yeah, hi. Um, you, you mentioned a couple times that Sable is computationally expensive. Um, I don't know if you already discussed why that is, in which case I apologize, I must have missed it, but I was curious if you could elaborate on that just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, Bayesian reasoning is, is thinking about, I've got this prior, I get some new evidence, and now I need to reason over this evidence. And so I need to consider the different possibilities, figure out those probabilities, and up, update my, my likelihoods. And in general, in, in many cases in artificial intelligence, this is the right thing to do. And in many cases, it is completely intractable because there are just too many computations. In this case, not only are we doing this Bayesian reasoning, which is slow in Sable, but then in iSable, we also need to think about, okay, what if the person's um, probability of giving a, uh, giving a good robot when the robot was right was 0.9? Well, what if it was 0.8? Well, what if it was 0.7? What if it was 0.75? Um, so trying to, in that case, we discretized, but trying to go through all of those different possibilities and then figure out, based on what I've seen in my prior, what is most likely. So it's that, that kind of exhaustive probability computation that kills you or can kill you in Bayesian reasoning. So what you often have to do is come up with some kind of approximation. Does that help? For sure. Uh, oh, yeah, yes. Um, just to slap on a technical word, does that mean there was like some sort of MCMC sampler or anything going on exactly. in there? I yep. see, okay. Yep. <laughs> We're absolutely doing EM, uh, expectation maximization to, to figure out the best parameters. I see, cool, thank you. And um, the, the other reason this is important is the human gives some piece of feedback and then you need to calculate all these probabilities, update your policy, and go to the next episode. So if a person is sitting there watching your dog, you don't have tons of time. And unless you do something like pause between each episode, or maybe you only update every 10 episodes, something like that. 
but in, in our case, we did want to have the updates happen in real time. So there was a limit. Since we had finite computation, there was a limit to how much um, uh, computation we could do. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Dramatic pause for other questions. Uh, yeah, one yeah. follow up on that. Yeah, is Sable computationally expensive or is it just the I Sable variation that is the behemoth? Uh, Sable can be expensive, but it is, uh, we found it to be completely feasible for the kinds of tasks we were doing. It was, you know, it's going to be slower than Q learning, but it was plenty fast enough to work in, in real time. Whereas I Sable is going to be um, much, much slower particularly depending on how you discretize those different probabilities. Sure. All right. So this was Sable. And then the other method that I wanted to mention was coach. So for those of you who are, are reinforcement learning people, spoiler, uh, we, we used an, uh, we treated the human feedback as an advantage function. So the, the way we thought about this, that came up with this is we're thinking about, well, first of all, is the feedback a response to the last action? So remember going back to the very first paper uh, from 2006, where we were saying, well, we could be talking about anticipating future things or the, the action you just took, but also, is the feedback stationary or is it gonna change over time? Well, we're, we think it is gonna change over time because people start giving less and less advice over time or less and less feedback. Okay, well, this was one of the advantages of collaborating with someone in psychology. Uh, people in psychology are really good at coming up with human user studies. So collaborators said, okay, well, let's, let's figure out what people are actually doing. So here's our domain. We have got this cute little dog and it's trying to get to the yellow box. The yellow is the goal. And confusingly, the green colors are bad. You, dog should not go on the, oh yeah, because you don't really want the dog going on the grass. And then you've got this slider. So the dog starts going, the dog starts doing its thing. And then you've got a slider where you can give it uh, a real valued punishment or reward. And we're trying to set up kind of kind of ground this by, by uh, putting in pictures. So saying bad dog versus saying good boy, all the way up to giving a cookie, or I don't recommend it, using a shock collar. So, so you could think of, well, different people might be more or less willing to make their dog fat or uh, to give pain to the dog, but some way, some kind of scale. So the cool thing that, that Mark did is let's have three different scenarios. First, we have the bad scenario where the dog just goes through the grass and gets to the goal state. Then we have the okay scenario where the dog avoids the grass but doesn't take an optimal route. And then of course you have the good scenario where the dog takes the optimal route. So our dog is not learning in this, in this subject, in this experiment. We have these three preset dog behaviors. And what we're gonna do is change the order in which people see them. So we, we had these three conditions. We said, first, I am gonna show the bad sequence, the bad sequence, and then the okay one. That means you're improving. The steady condition continually takes the okay se sequence. And then the degrading says, I'm gonna do the optimal policy twice and then do the okay policy once. And the important thing in all three conditions, the final task is the medium one. So we're gonna look at what do people give feedback to the dog on that final task? And it turns out people give higher feedback, better feedback to the dog in the improving condition. So what does this mean? There are three different settings. 
and we look at the final task where the, the dog has the same uh, task performance, the same policy, and we see that the feedback people give to the dog on that final task does not just depend on what the dog is doing, because all of these are the same. Instead, it depends on the relative performance. How did the dog do relative to what it was doing before? So this was, uh, this is why one of the reasons I like trying to collaborate with psychology people, I never, never would have thought of doing this experiment. But now we went and did an experiment and showed there is a situation where people give different feedback to the same task based on the past. And then we said, well, let's build an algorithm that can use that. So this is what the advantage function is. So we've got this Q value that's um, in, in RL, how, what is the value of the action I'm taking in this state? Hey Matt. And then, sorry, go ahead. And just on the last slide, can you maybe elaborate a little further? Was this the same person that would go through all three scenarios? Um, and were they given the scenarios in different orders? Like for instance, were they first shown an improving set of conditions, like these three different cases, then they were shown the steady condition one, then the grading one, or are these like three independent sets of people that were tested with these three different cases? Yeah, so I, if I remember right here, it was a person comes in, gets one of these three things, and then leaves. Okay, okay. So the person sees three policy rollouts but does not see the, the different um, uh, conditions. So, uh, because otherwise you're right, then they, they might be um, giving feedback based on something else. Okay, so they're, they're, yeah, each person is just giving feedback for one of the three conditions and that's all they, they give feedback for and then they leave. Exactly, so if, you, if you've got someone, it, some people uh, may use the shock collar a lot. Some people may use um, the, the dog biscuits a lot. And one thing you could do is try to have that person, uh, each person go through multiple conditions to kind of normalize out. In this case, because of what we wanted to study, we wanted each person to go once and then you just need a bunch more data. So you, you hope that you get, of those people who are more likely to give the shock collar, you hope that they're balanced out among these different conditions. Yes, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. So V is saying, what is the value of a state? How good is, do I think this state is? Versus Q is saying, what is the action? How good is the action that I'm taking at this state? So for instance, if I do something uh, surprisingly brilliant, my Q value could be better than what I was expecting to get out of the state. Or if I do something stupid, then my Q value will be lower than what I was expecting to get out of this state. So the framework we use is actor critic learning, which um, the RL people are probably familiar with, where we've got an actor, which is just has this policy that's parameterized. And then the critic estimates the behavior. The critic looks at the actor and then gives critiques. And Rich, back in 2000 and others, showed that the actor critic architecture will converge to a local optimum when you do the policy gradient updates and the important point when the critic is providing the advantage. So if a computational critic is providing this advantage as its critique, then you will converge to a local optimum. So convergent actor critic by humans, a, a slightly awkward backronym, we are going to have the human be the critic and we're gonna use the feedback directly. So we're gonna just say, the human is giving me an advantage. And if I assume that, then this actually works. Um, so then I'll, and then the paper goes on to show that yes, indeed it works. Uh, this was at ICML a few years ago. The other thing I'll mention but won't go into is there are also a few tricks that didn't get a whole lot of emphasis but trying to deal with that real-time interaction. So for instance, summing together successive feedbacks. So if, if the person can hit the button multiple times, you can just sum those together. 
you could think of having eligibility traces. So in reinforcement learning and eligibility trace, um, the backwards view is looking at if I get some reward, how should I spread that reward out backwards over time? Because if I, if I win the game, it's probably not just the last action that made me win the game. I should probably give some credit to the actions further back. And this could happen in human training as well. So the human could say, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you um, advantage based on the last three actions you've been taking, or I'm gonna give you the advantage over the last three episodes, or maybe I'm going to give you the advantage over the last step. And the human could say that, they would have to know what an eligibility trace is though, or you could try to implicitly learn that. And the last thing I'll mention is something that Tamer introduced, which was the credit, credit delay. So thinking about if I have time and I see some feedback here, I probably do not want to reward, or uh, the advantage is probably not for this point in time, it's probably for some past point in time. Unless I am going very slowly, it's unlikely the human will give me feedback on exactly the step the action, uh, the relevant action was taken. <coughs> All right, so this was coach. Oh, that's right, I also wanted to mention reward loops. So let's say um, the agent, it, you've got this uh, four state MDP and the, this is the, the end of the episode when you go right uh, off the fourth one and the human's gonna give you a small reward for each of these transitions that you do correctly. But in that last state, there's another transition. You could decide to go up. Now, if the human was giving you plus one every time you go to the right and gave you minus one every time you made this mistake, the agent is going to learn the right thing to do is go in this loop. Because every time I go through this loop, I get plus two. And there's no reason for me to actually finish the episode. Whereas in coach, because you're not looking, you're not thinking about these immediate rewards, but thinking about the advantage, you're able to avoid this kind of a weird corner case. So that was kind of a, a side benefit. Okay, so this is a great place to pause. I was trying to go through these, these four different methods. Uh, well, obviously to build off of Brad's presentation on Tuesday, uh, but to show you that there are different reasonable ways of interpreting human feedback. And you could think about doing experiments to try to figure out what people mean in general. You could try to figure out what this trainer means. I don't think people have done a lot of work on trying to teach the trainer. So for instance, getting people to, you could set up a study so that you taught a person how to give a good advantage reward. Or you could teach a person how to give good feedback in the, in the um, Sable setting. And that question of, well, how long are you going to interact with this person? In, in the empathetic study, uh, we are looking at people interacting with an agent for about three minutes at a time. You're not gonna get a whole lot of teaching done then. But if you, if you just bought a new $5,000 robot that you're going to bring home and you're going to use for the next four years, there's a great opportunity to teach the person how to interact, as well as bet, mo putting a lot of effort into modeling that person to really get the most out of those interactions that you can. To try to make the most use of whatever advice that person tells you. So that was looking at this feedback, good robot, bad robot, plus one, minus one, here's the advantage. As we brainstormed before, we also talked about learning from demonstration. The feedback we talked about um, just now was looking at how do, how do I do what the human wants me to do? There's no environmental reward. 
Learning from demonstration is anal analogous. In general, we assume that there is no environmental reward and I want to learn what the person is doing. I'm going to assume in general that the person is near optimal and I want to mimic that. So this often means that if my demonstrator is very bad or doesn't understand the task, my performance is going to be very bad. And this programming by demonstration started, I believe in the eighties, where we're saying, look, I, I want my robot to do um, difficult things. I don't want to spend the time programming exactly what it needs to do. I just want to have it mimic me. And there's, there's a bunch of ways you could do this. One way would be imitation learning. So I could raise my hand and then try to get the robot to raise its hand. I could raise my other hand, try to get the robot to raise its hand. And then there's the correspondence problem. So am I raising, is, is, should the ro robot be raising its right hand or should the robot be raising the hand that's over to this side of the screen? So trying to figure out or another example, if you hit um, a, a ball in table tennis, how does that correspond to a robot moving its arm to hit a ball in table tennis? You could also do teleoperation. So that's what, uh, uh, or, or kinematic operation. So in this case, what we're seeing on the, on the right here is the person is moving the robot arm around. So now there's no correspondence problem. The robot knows exactly which joints are moving in which way, but now the human needs to understand how to manipulate this robot. So robots often have, robots can have kind of confusing degrees of freedom and are often not exactly, um, uh, are not often analogous with a human arm. So whereas you have a, a fixed number, you've got your, um, your elbow, your wrist, you've got your shoulder joint, the robot may have more or fewer degrees of freedom and getting the end effector where you want it may be non-trivial. But you could think of doing this learning from demonstration. It, uh, it's also called apprenticeship learning, it's called behavior cloning, trying to just mimic what the person was demonstrating. The last thing I'll mention too, which, uh, which we're not getting into today at all, is called inverse reinforcement learning. So this is another way of using a demonstration. You can say, again, there is no reward coming from the environment, but I'm gonna assume the person is opt acting optimally. If I assume the person was acting optimally, what reward were they maximizing? So if I think about, I, I'm, I'm trying to get my agent to learn how to drive autonomously, it's got to trade off speed with safety, with uh, gas usage, um, how obnoxious you are, if you're tailgating or not. So you could have these different things that you could evaluate the agent over and inverse reinforcement learning could figure out how to weight those different things. So we have three minutes left and I really want to show, because I, I optimized this to show a video, so by golly, I'm going to show a video. Um, no, I'm not. There, we'll, we'll save this for next time. So what, what I'd like to do on Tuesday is to go through a little bit of these learning from demonstration methods, because they're, they're pretty, they're uh, started with robotics, but they're used throughout sequential decision-making tasks. They're a very natural way of interacting with a person. So I wanna go through some of these learning from demonstration and then talk about how we can combine demonstrations with reinforcement learning. That's where we'll, we'll be going. And I will drop a, a few reading requests on the website, ask you to do that for Tuesday. And then I'm really excited next Thursday, I have a colleague from um, a AIR, a uh, Artificial Intelligence Refined coming. So this is a startup out of Montreal that works on the intersection of human in the loop and reinforcement learning and simulation. So Dorian's gonna come and talk a little bit about his company and the technology that they're using and why he sees interactive machine learning as the critical next step in bringing artificial intelligence, re reinforcement learning and machine learning into real world settings. So, uh, um, 
um, through the reading and through Tuesday's class. Hopefully I'll cover all the necessary background to fully understand Dorian's talk on Thursday. So I'm gonna end here. I will keep my annotations. And now are there, are there any final questions or comments before we stop streaming? I have one thing. I've yeah. got two things actually, but I'll, I'll start with one. Uh, so the reward loop thing, I just noticed uh, at first I thought, well, you could just make the last square plus a thousand and then it, does, it gets out of the loop until I realized it gets plus two every time it goes through the loop. So presumably it just goes around 501 times and now, now it's beating it. But for, I, there's a fundamental thing that I think I don't understand about policies. Is it that, uh, so if it's got a policy and it knows plus one, plus one, plus a thousand, then does it get some general rule like going through that loop gives me plus two, therefore I should always go through that loop? Or does it have to get to that last square and explore every time to actually, like, would it have to explore 500 times uh, at perhaps like a, a, a low probability to actually realize that it was smartest to go through? Because if it's doing like a greedy, greedy thing, then every time until it's at a thousand points, that plus a thousand is always going to be better. That's right. So if, if the person could say good robot, bad robot, but also say plus one, plus a thousand, minus one, then uh, it, the short term thing would be to go get that plus a thousand. But through exploration and through learning, eventually it will learn, oh, I can get infinite reward if I just keep doing this loop. Right. And so does it learn the kind of the rule of thumb of this doing the whole loop? leads to infinite reward or does it have to explore a whole bunch of times in a row like it would it would go through the first time and it would get like a thousand and two points and it would keep on doing that until maybe it decides to explore and says oh wait a thousand and four points that's better um and then it would have to do that oh wait every time until it actually gets higher right so you're you'd be learning these q values and initially the at the final state, the Q value for ending would be a thousand. Um, and then the Q value for going up might be initially random, but then after you go up the first time, you realize, oh, I'm gonna get minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus a thousand. So if I go up, I get a thousand and two. And then the next time you get to that final state, you can say, well, I can either go up and get a thousand and two, or I can go right and get a thousand. So I'll go up and around and oh, now I get a thousand and four if I go up. So you end up having this runaway uh, towards, towards infinity. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I think I'm gonna cut us off from streaming now and recording. Thank you all. I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. I hope we have a good weekend.